Man, I'm not going to be preaching the sermon that I had planned on preaching this morning. I'm going to be preaching something different. And unfortunately, I've got to start out with some very bad news. And that is that, you know, there are still people in our church who are getting sucked into this oneness garbage and forsaking the Trinity. Now, I find that hard to believe since I've gotten up here and preached it to the point of ridiculousness. Each one of those 48 Trinity moments disproves this modalist oneness garbage. Any one of them alone does. And there's 48 of them. You know, so I mean, I'm, I'm up here, I'm preaching the Bible, I'm spending hours and hours and hours of time behind the pulpit covering this. You know, I don't know what else to do as a pastor. I don't know what else to say except for this. This doctrine is not an optional doctrine. The Trinity is a foundation of our Christian belief. It has been for thousands of years, and we will not budge. We will not compromise. And I'm not going to be a respecter of persons. I don't care who it is. If you're one that's been at our church for years, and you're like, well, I'm just still not sure, then you know what? Just get out and come back when you're sure then. Because you know what? That is not acceptable to come to this church for years and years and hear me preach about it for hours and hours and hours and hours and you're still not sure if the Trinity's true. You got a problem, buddy. And you know what? You take your problem somewhere else. You know how long it's going to take me to throw somebody out of this church that doesn't believe in the Trinity? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Now, you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, and if by the time I'm done preaching this morning, you don't believe in the Trinity, then get out and don't ever come back. Amen. Because if you don't believe in the Trinity, you are not welcome in this church. Throughout Jewish history, the identity of God has always been misrepresented. God was at times substituted or misrepresented as someone or something else than what was outlined in the Holy Scriptures. In the days of Israel, they were always replacing the one true God, who was referred to as the Father, with other gods to be like the other nations around them. The Jews didn't deny that there was only one God, but it was how they portrayed him that was their sin, which got them into trouble time and time again with the Almighty. After their redemption from Egyptian slavery, when Israel was given the commandments on tables of stone, the very first thing that God was trying to teach them about himself was found in the very first commandment. In Exodus chapter 20 verses 2 to 3, it says the following, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. From the great miracles that God the Father works through his servant Moses and to the law that was given to them, God was trying to teach Israel time and time again that he was the only true God. Because of Egyptian bondage, the knowledge of God was nearly forgotten. So wherever they wandered or sojourned, it was Moses' role to teach the people about who God was and what he was trying to accomplish through them. Then, 
From the book of Exodus, we begin to see a horrifying turn of events beginning to take place with the children of Israel. In the book of Exodus, it charts the progress of how God really revealed himself to Israel through the amazing miracles conducted through Moses and the mighty miracle at the Red Sea crossing. Israel was taught clearly about who God was through miracles and his laws. They were without excuse. Unfortunately, the book of Exodus also highlights how Israel quickly turned their backs on the only true God and replaced him with other gods because of their corrupt mindsets. In Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 8, it states the following. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow, and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Through reading through this sacred history account of Israel, we can clearly see that Israel was replacing the only true God with plural gods. This next point is important. Aaron was replacing the only true God. He made the people believe that they were still worshipping God. These be thy gods, plural, O Israel. And most of Israel believed the lie and worshipped this replacement God. Another sad account in sacred history where Israel had replacement gods instead of the only true God can be found in the account of King Jeroboam, found in the book of Kings. This king of Israel caused many people to sin for generations. After the infighting among some of the tribes in Israel, God permitted Israel to be split into two. Israel was then the northern kingdom and Judah was the southern kingdom which still retained Jerusalem. In the book of Kings, you read how King Jeroboam did not want his subjects to go to Jerusalem to keep the feasts, just in case they decided to join the people of Judah. So instead, he set up two golden calves in his kingdom, one in Dan and the other at Bethel, where people could go and worship God. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 28 to 30, it teaches us the following about Israel. Whereupon the king, Jeroboam, took counsel and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, 
it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So King Jeroboam did exactly what Aaron had done to Israel in the early years. Jeroboam was replacing the only true God with other plural gods, making the people believe that they were still worshipping one God. Israel has always had a problem worshipping the true identity of the only true God. In fact, God the Father expressed this in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 17, where it reads, They sacrifice unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Notice, in this verse it says gods, plural. Israel has always at some time had replacement gods instead of the only true God. Moses always made sure that he taught Israel the truth regarding who God really was, so that each successive generation would clearly understand who God was and not be ensnared by false doctrines concerning who God was from the other nations around them. In Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 30, Moses stated the following, Take heed to yourself, but thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Sadly, as we move on to our modern times, modern Israel has followed in the same footsteps as ancient Israel, as we're about to see. I'm telling you from my perspective what the Bible says. The Trinity, Seventh-day Adventists believe there is one God and that this one God is three co-eternal persons who work together in unity. We fully embrace our fundamental belief number two, which indicates that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and always will be. Make no mistake about it. The divine trinity work in unison as one within the Godhead from eternity to eternity. Allow God to use you, every one of you, to share this wonderful truth of a triune God who is carrying out his plan of salvation for each of us. The replacement of the only true God to worshipping a triune God or three gods is not new. In the days of ancient Israel, God the Father condemned ancient Israel for doing the same thing. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 33, God tells us the following, Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Astaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the God of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways, to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. So we see that ancient Israel was accused by God of worshipping three different gods, Astaroth, Chemosh, and Milcom, exactly the same as today, three co-eternal beings who are all separate and different 
but who are also God in their own right, the Trinity. The idea of plural gods, such as the Trinity, was spearheaded by the Roman Catholic Church system from approximately AD 381 and has been adopted by nearly all the churches all over the world, contrary to the scriptures of truth. Sadly, today, virtually all the Christian churches are misrepresenting who God really is. Here is the definition of the Trinity. If you write anything down tonight, write this down. God is one in being and three in person, Father, Son, and we Spirit. Learned in chapter 1 that the man is made in the image of God who said, let us make man in our image. Let, let us... Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image. The triune God who has always for all eternity existed in perfect unity and harmony within the Godhead. This one God in three persons. God the Father, the Son, and God the Spirit. No, I believe that when the Bible says one God, it's talking about the three persons. And then... Even at the baptism of Jesus, you see the three persons of the Godhead. You see God the Father speaking from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son. God the Son is in the water. God the Spirit is coming down in the form of a dove. And so there's a number of cases how God uh, is three persons, but God is united in his work of saving man. Uh, you can find, now the word Trinity, of course, is not in the Bible. I don't know that you find the word Bible in the Bible, but we know the Bible exists. Um, the word trinity is just a Latin word, tri, entity. It means three entities, like a tricycle has three wheels. It's talking about the three entities of God. And so I want to get hung up on the word. It's the idea of the Godhead, that the God that we worship, uh, there's these three persons that are actively involved with different roles in our salvation. Um, you've got God the Father so loving the world that he sends God the, spot, the Son and then we are saved and empowered through God the Spirit and guided through God the Spirit. And so they're all working in different roles, but there are three persons in the Godhead that you see. There is one Protestant church that has really misrepresented the only true God and has replaced him as a triune God. And this is sadly the Seventh-day Adventist church. In one of their recent Sabbath school quarterlies, it dedicated a whole section called the triune god the origin of mission and essentially lied to the people explaining that there are three beings who are all god and are essentially helping us to save humanity in another disturbing instance in one of the children's bible study guides the seventh day adventist church stated the shocking quote did you know that God is really three individuals, three gods that make one God? Sadly, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as well as the rest of the Christian churches of the world, are in utter darkness concerning on who God really is. The Christian world is in a chaotic mess but thankfully God has a plan to arrest his people's attention and to bring them back to him. A message of warning, reproof and correction is now going forth to the church and the world regarding the truth concerning the only true God and the false doctrine of the Trinity and other false gods of Satan that preoccupy the hearts of men today. This message will grow louder and louder as time goes by and as we are about to see and have read in the scriptures of truth great changes will very soon take place on this earth and then truths which have been made obscured by man will shine brightly and brilliantly.
it's strong to rattle earthquake. pretty strong here. In the book of Revelation, there is a message of warning, reproof and correction, which is part of the everlasting gospel, which will be heard by every man, woman and child before the coming of God's Son, Christ, in glory. This message is called the Three Angels' Messages and is the most solemn warning message ever given to man from God. In Revelations chapter 14, verses 6 to 12, it teaches us the following. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of a wrath of a fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Since the late 1800s, right down to our modern busy times, the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 has been sounded. These messages will be proclaimed louder and louder as this world descends even into greater chaos. We are going to examine more closely the first angel's message as taught in Revelation 14, 6-7 to see exactly how God is using this message to destroy the falsehood surrounding the Trinity doctrine and other plurality of gods. In Revelations chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, it tells us the following. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This message is a clear message for every inhabitant on this earth to get back to worshipping the only true God and to remember that he is also the creator of the heavens and the earth by keeping his Sabbath, which is clearly revealed in the commandments of God. But the question that we need to ask is, is this, who is Revelation 14, 7 referring to? The general consensus among many Christians today is that Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7 must be referring to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But further examinations of this verse proves that it cannot be, as in verse 7 
we see that the singular pronouns of him and his is clearly used in this verse. Furthermore, this God is also identified as the supreme creator that made the heavens and the earth. So the questions that we need to ask is this. Who is this God who is the him and the his? And who is this God who is also the creator? To get the answers to these very important questions, then we need to look no further than seeing what Christ taught. He is the highest source of authority when it comes to any doctrine or question. Not a man or a scholar or a priest or a pastor has any higher authority on the word of God than Christ. So, who did Christ identify as God? In John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, Christ declares the following. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Then, Christ makes it even clearer who the identity of God is in John chapter 20 and verse 17. And it reads, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Then, in John chapter 6 and verse 27, Christ states the following, Labour not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him have God the Father sealed. Then, to make it even clearer on who the identity of God really is, Christ declared the following in John chapter 17, verses 1 and verse 3. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And now verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now that we have established from Christ himself that the Father, or Jehovah, is God, is the Father also the one being identified as the Supreme Creator in the first angel's message of Revelation 14 and verse 7? Who did Christ identify as the Supreme Creator? In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25, Christ begins to answer this question. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Then, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, Christ makes it even clearer who the Supreme Creator really is. And it reads, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son 
to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Then, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 and verse 30, Christ declares who the Supreme Creator is. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And now verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And finally, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 to 35, Christ once again declares who is the supreme ruler of the heavens and the earth. And it reads, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. So, again from the highest source of authority, we see that it is the Father who is the Supreme Creator. Before Christ came to this earth in human flesh, his Father created things through him. This is clearly explained in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, and it reads, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So we see that the first angel's message is a call back to the worship of the only true God, who is the Father. As the scriptures of truth has clearly revealed, the Father is the Him and His being referred to in the first angel's message. The scriptures of truth also make it absolutely clear that the Father is also the Supreme Creator. In the first angel's message of Revelation 14 and verse 7, it tells us something very interesting and it says, For the hour of his judgment is come. What does this mean and how are we judged? The hour of God's judgment has come. This means right now God is weighing the characters of everyone who has ever lived, from the days of Adam and Eve, and right up to our modern times. God is weighing up everyone's character to see who should be saved through the precious blood of his Son which was shed for us. So how can God be fair and measure us? What yardstick can he use to measure our characters and at the same time allow people to know what this measuring stick is? Well, we don't need to guess or to speculate because the scriptures of truth will now give us the answer. In James chapter 2 verses 10 to 12, it teaches us the following. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. 
So, the Ten Commandments will be used by God to judge our characters. The reason why the law is called the law of liberty is because having the knowledge of God's commandments is essential as it frees us from sin. Having the knowledge of God's law helps us to detect and keep away from sin. This is clearly revealed in the following scripture verses. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 12, it teaches us the following. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Then, in Romans 3.20, it says, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, it teaches the following, I had not known sin, but by the law. And finally, in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, it declares the following, Sin is the transgression of the law. The importance of knowing and keeping God's commandments is further emphasized during the Mark of the Beast crisis. Those that are saved from the wrath of God, as detailed in the third angel's message in verse 10, will be keeping all of God's Ten Commandments. This is clearly outlined in Revelations chapter 14 and verse 12, and it reads, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We must stress, however, that keeping the commandments of God will not ever give us a place in heaven, for the scriptures of truth says, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. But one must show his willingness to yield to the demands of God before he can ever have the blood of Christ to wash his sins away. This is why Revelations chapter 14 and verse 12 emphasizes the point that those that keep God's commandments will not trust in their righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ our Saviour. In the book of John, looking down prophetic time, Christ also addressed the importance of knowing who God really is and how we are to worship him. In John chapter 4 verses 21 to 24, Christ says the following, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Indeed, that time has now come, but they that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. The message that Christ gave in John chapter 4 verses 21 to 24 is very similar to the first angel's message in Revelations chapter 14 and verse 7. The hour of his judgment is come. That hour has now come. God expects us to be worshipping him in truth. There is much talk about the 144,000 in Revelations chapter 14, but no matter who they are or what this number represents, 
most people overlook something regarding them. In Revelations chapter 14 and verse 1, it says that the 144,000 have the Father's name written in their foreheads, meaning that this unique set of people believe that the Father is the only true God and they have his character operating in their lives. They understand that it is the Father who is the source of all things and that they clearly understand the everlasting gospel which shows that there is a literal God, the Father, a single personal being who has also a literal Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as a man and defeated sin as a man to be an example to every human being that through the power of God, they too can defeat the devil and his works. This eternal truth God is making very prominent in these last days because the gospel truth has been destroyed by the Trinity doctrine which undermines the gospel message by subtly denying the fact that there is a literal God called the Father who has sent his literal only begotten Son to pay the penalty for our sins. This truth should never be forgotten by man because the undeniable fact is that without the Father, the source of all things, then we would not have had his Son. And without the Son, we would have had no salvation. To those who are watching, do you not think it is time to yield yourself under the first angel's message and replace the Trinity or Triune God with the only true God, who is the Father? Sadly, the Bible teaches that the worship of replacement false gods led to the demise of ancient Israel. Sadly, the teaching and worship of the Trinity would lead to the demise of modern Israel. We have been warned. In 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 7, 9 and 16, the Lord teaches us the following. Go tell Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I have exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, verse 9, but has done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and has cast me behind thy back. And now verse 16. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. We have been warned.